Thanks. Thanks, Christian. Um, yeah, there you go. Has everybody had a coffee? <laughs> Woken up a little bit? Yeah, cool. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm Chris Lovell. I'm from University of Portsmouth in the UK. Uh, just started. Um, big thanks to the organizers. This last few weeks has been amazing. I've learned so much. Um, it's kind of sad that it's over. <laughs> um, okay, so the kind of background here, what I'm going to talk about is this galaxy halo relationship and how we're going to try and model this using normalizing flows and the camel simulations. Hopefully everybody knows the first sentence. Um, but essentially, you know, the reason for going over this is that this is a key relationship, this galaxy halo relationship, for understanding how galaxies relate to the underlying cosmology, right? So we have this connection between galaxies and halos. If we can measure the abundances, clustering, and, and lensing of galaxies, we can learn something about the underlying dark matter halos that they reside in. And so, you know, one of the key results from a lot of the work that's gone into this from, you know, for, for observationally is this, uh, you know, stellar to halo mass relation, peaking at a um, halo mass of 10 to the 12 m solar, some uncertainty at this low mass end that's been discussed a little bit over the last couple of days. This is one of the key results that's come out of this. On the modeling side, there's a whole gamut of different um, approaches to, to learning this halo galaxy relationship from sort of halo occupation models that are more empirically um, uh, driven all the way to hydrodynamic simulations, which you know, self-consistently model the, the baryons and the dark matter together. Now, if you actually want to, you know, if you want to run a simulation, a hydro simulation, you essentially, uh, you have three kind of axes of merit that you're kind of constrained by, right? Unfortunately, you can't run an enormous box at very high resolution with all of the physics you want. That's computationally impossible. Um, so if you're doing a hydrodynamic simulation, you're really limited by resolution and volume. And so you see this, this kind of figure of merit here shows dark matter uh, resolution on the x-axis against the volume probes. And there's this general relationship here where as you go to higher resolution, you can only do smaller boxes. So there are ways of getting around this. So one of the projects I'm involved with is flares, first light and reionization epoch simulations, which uses zoom simulations taken from a range of overdensities to essentially try and mimic a larger volume. So that's this large line on this plot here. Um, but there's also machine learning applications here. So if we could learn the relationship between galaxies and halos in a self-consistent way over a large dynamic range, then maybe we can actually paint galaxies onto n-body codes to get the volumes that we need, but motivated by hydrodynamic simulations. The other you know, important point here about the volume side of things is that we really need large volumes in order to compare to some of the upcoming wide field surveys uh, that are coming in the very, very near future. So things like Euclid and Roman are going to carry out these incredibly wide surveys, which are shown, hopefully you can kind of see there's these different boxes here showing the sort of um, uh, the depths probed and the, the areas covered by these different surveys at redshifts, you know, reasonably high redshifts. The dotted line here is the Eagle periodic kind of fiducial simulation, 100 megaparsecs cubed. And one of the main things to take away here is that in some of these surveys, we actually don't have any of the simulated galaxies um, within those, those boxes, right? Essentially, these galaxies are so rare, they're bright, but they're so rare that they're simply not, not simulated by these small volumes. So if we really want to probe um, galaxies that are going to be discovered in these surveys, we need these much larger volumes to capture these rare objects. So with flares, we can statistically combine these zoom simulations together, and we get sort of, you know, we're able to then probe these, these, these bright, rare, um, rare, rare objects. Um, but this is so, you know, one way of doing this that gives us these abundances, but we don't actually get by doing this the full distribution of galaxies. So we can't measure things like clustering, for example. So this is where this galaxy halo relationship comes in and, and how we can use machine learning to model this. So this is a, a piece of work that from, um, from last year where we essentially took, um, so, yeah, so this, this relationship is, you know, there's an awful lot of work here. So lots of people in the room, we heard from Christian yesterday using graph neural networks, and Natalie as well has worked on this too. Um, so in this particular work, the actual machine learning model is pretty simple, right? So it's only a random forest, uh, sorry, extremely randomized trees model here. But the unique thing about this approach is that we combined periodic simulations and zoom simulations together. Um, so we took zooms of cluster environments at redshift zero. So from 10 to the, a few times 10 to the 15 solar mass all the way down to 10 to the 14 solar mass. We combined or matched the halos in those, as well as these periodic boxes, 100 megaparsec and 50 megaparsec. We matched the halos in the dark matter version of that simulation with a full hydro simulation. And then we train a machine to learn that relationship. 
And so this is some of the results that we actually get out. So the orange line here is the original periodic eagle box. So you have pretty poor statistics at this high mass end. Um, this is what you get the dashed line if you just train on a 50 megaparsec box and then apply this to a larger dark matter box. So clearly, you're not able to predict these, these massive objects. It's kind of obvious. Here's what you get when you train on the zooms as well, and then apply this to a much larger box. So just to mention it here, we apply this model then to this p-millennium simulation, which is 800 megaparsecs on the side. So you're able to predict the galaxy stellar mass function out to a much larger dynamic range, get you know, really great statistics at this high mass end that you simply couldn't do with a simple, uh, with a, uh, traditional periodic box. You can also do things like clustering with this, right? So confusingly, the colors are switched around, <laughs> apologies. So the blue here now is the eagle periodic box. Um, this is just the projected correlation function. And the, the orange here is the result of the model trained on the zooms. And so the thing to take away here, there's a few details here that I can talk about later, but essentially, because of the size of this periodic box, the 100 megaparsec one, you're only able to propose probe scales below a certain limit. You also don't have that many massive galaxies to measure these clustering statistics over. Whereas from the machine learned model applied to this larger DMO sim, we can extend these clustering statistics measurements out to much larger scales and also to much larger objects and start actually comparing to these are gamma results uh, in this regime you simply couldn't do with the periodic simulations. So this is all great. It's all you know fantastic, but there are some issues with these models. So these are fully deterministic models. So you have some set of halo parameters <laughs> that go in, and that gives you some baryonic galaxy parameters out. But because these are fully deterministic, what you end up doing is actually uh, underestimating the scatter in some of these distribution functions, right? So this is stellar mass against black hole mass, stellar mass against metallicity. Uh, the, the red here is the kind of input training data from the zooms, from the periodic boxes. And the blue is the prediction from this model. And I don't know if you can see, but the actual uh, the scatter around that blue curve is, uh, is very small, right? So you're underpredicting the scatter at fixed stellar mass. Um, so there's lots of examples of this. I'm showing my work, to be fair, <laughs> but this is, uh, this is a kind of key problem. The other thing we'd like to be able to do as well is to you know, use these machine learning models for inference, right? We want to rapidly generate galaxy populations, not only just you know, from a single machine learn um, uh, input training set, um, but also for you know, a range of different parameters, right? Um, so we need large training sets that cover a significant volume of this multidimensional parameter space. So Joe mentioned yesterday that normalizing flows are old and tired now, but um, I only heard about them last year, so uh, yeah, they're still new and exciting to me. Um, so these are you know, a method essentially for doing density estimation. So you can learn a multidimensional density directly, and the way it does is it takes some simple base distribution. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but just to kind of go over this again quickly, take a simple base distribution, you apply a series of bijective transformations to produce a, a much more complex output distribution. And this is just an example showing a, you know, a, a fit to the stellar mass star formation rate plane using this approach where you're able to reproduce not only the marginals, but also the joint distribution. What's nice as well about these is that you can input conditional uh, dependencies on these densities, right? So you can predict the value of some distribution x given some conditional parameter z. So in this work, what we actually do is we train two normalizing flows. We train one to learn the density distribution of our conditional parameters, and one to learn the density distribution of our predictors conditioned on the inputs. Paco's already talked a lot about camels and given a fantastic introduction to that, and hopefully everybody's aware now of what CAMELS is, but just to the details that are relevant to this is we use the LH set from Simba. So we're only looking at Simba here, keep things simple. <laughs> um, and we're looking at all of these parameters, the cosmological parameters, omega m and sigma eight, and the supernovae and AGM parameters. And we're just looking at redshift zero. So this is 3.9 million subhalos in this snapshot with uh, subhalo masses above 10 to the 10 m solar. And so these are some of the results just fit into that density distribution. So the top right here are our conditional parameters. So we condition on subhalo mass as well as these six parameters. And then on the left here are the predictive galaxy properties. So we predict stellar mass, star formation rate, black hole mass, and, and uh, gas mass. 
And you'll notice within these distributions that you see these kind of weird discrete spikes. So we fit to this in log space. So we set zero valued um, parameters essentially to some small value. And you might ask, why don't we just like get rid of them, right? Why, do, why, are, you, why are you modeling the, the unresolved galaxies? So this becomes important when we're using this as a generative model. What we actually want to do is be able to self-consistently predict halos that actually contain unresolved galaxies and get the abundances correct. So, so that's why we keep these in here. Okay, so now that we've trained oh, sorry. now that we've trained this model, we can start using this to actually explore the Simba LH set and start asking some interesting questions. So what I'm doing here is essentially uh, generating 10 to the 4 samples from my first flow, the conditional flow, and then changing one of those, which is halo mass, to some fixed value. And then what I do is I input those into the conditional flow and predict the galaxy properties. And so this is essentially marginalizing over all of the other parameters. So it's saying, what is the effect of halo mass on, on galaxy properties, ignoring the impact of cosmology and astrophysics? And so you get out something like this, right, which is kind of obvious, but yeah, higher mass halos have more stars, higher mass halos have more gas, higher mass halos have bigger black holes. I think what's interesting about this is you get the full distributions of these parameters uh, for that given halo mass, marginalizing over everything else. Things get a little bit more interesting when you look at the other parameters. So now we're looking at ASM1 in the top right and ASM2 in the bottom. So you can see that ASM1 has a big impact on star formation rates. You tend to see actually larger black hole masses for a, a, for a larger ASM1 value. Um, gas masses are kind of completely unaffected, interestingly. Whereas ASM2, you don't see as large, a, as large an impact on the, on, the, uh, on the stellar mass in particular. AGM parameters have even smaller effects, right? AGM2 seems to actually have zero effect on these galaxy properties. Whereas AGM1 has no effect on everything else except black hole mass. So actually, when you increase the value of AGM1, you actually get smaller black holes. So this is actually telling us something about how the model works, right? In a, in a way that you perhaps uh, can't do with just the one piece set, where you're looking at essentially a very small slither of the, of the manifold. This is you know, implicitly marginalizing over everything else. Now what we can also do is condition on two parameters. So here what we're saying is we're fixing the halo mass and then varying one of our parameters. So now we're saying, okay, how does supernova feedback affect small mass halos or higher mass halos? And so one of the interesting things you find is that ASM1 seems to affect you know, both low mass and high mass halos, particularly in terms of the stellar mass. Whereas ASM2 has zero effect on the stellar mass of low mass halos. So sorry, this row here, lower mass halos 10 to the 10.5. These are 10 to the 11.5 M solar halos. So it seems to suggest that ASN2 actually you know, is only uh, impacting these very, very high mass halos and, and high mass galaxies. Okay, so we built this model, but how do we actually know that it's kind of working? So we've done tests on like outside uh, the training set, but a really nice one that we can do is compare to the 1P set. So this is a set of uh, camel simulations where you set everything else to fiducial parameters and you just change a single parameter. So these are combinations of parameters that weren't included in the training set. Um, but what you see is so the dashed lines here are the predictions from the flow, and the solid lines are the one piece set. The general trend is in very, very good agreement, and there are some slight differences here. Now we think we can attribute this to kind of remaining offsets being variants essentially between the boxes, so different initial conditions and different random seeds. But essentially, the overall, the, the trends are, able, uh, are reproduced really, really well. Okay, so now that we've got this model that we, you know, we can explore uh, the impact of cosmology and astrophysics, but because we've conditioned on subhalo mass, we can also use this as a generative model. So what we can do is we can take some subhalos with, uh, with masses from the LH set and then predict a galaxy in each of those subhalos. And then from that, we can measure anything we want. But in this example, we're looking at the galaxy stellar mass function. So the blue line here is the true galaxy stellar mass function from a given LH set simulation. The orange is the median of 100 different realizations of this sampling, and the, and the, the scatter here is shown by the, the shaded region. 
So this is just, you know, essentially able to generate the galaxy stellar mass function for arbitrary parameters. So we can do this for all sorts of different LH sets. One of the things I think to, to point out here and to emphasize is the huge diversity in the galaxy stellar mass function between each of these LH boxes, right? There's differences in the normalization of the low mass end of greater than one dex. So this isn't a trivial problem. There's actually a huge amount of variation here, but we're able to capture and, and reproduce the galaxy stellar mass function really, really well. And also, like I said, actually get uncertainties here um, that you might not be able to get otherwise. Because we've also got this conditional condition on other parameters, what we can then do is say, okay, how does ASM1 or, 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 our, or our cosmological parameters affect the galaxy stellar mass function rather than just distributions of galaxy properties? So again, what we do is we, we generate galaxies within these subhalos, but then we keep one of those parameters fixed. So in the top, we're showing the impact of omega m on the galaxy stellar mass function in different regions. On the bottom here, we're showing sigma 8. So sigma 8 has, doesn't seem to have a huge impact, which you might expect, but omega m actually, you know, in, in intermediate masses can have quite a large impact. ASM1 and ASM2 are much larger impact, as you might expect. So ASM1, particularly at the low mass end, which kind of fits with what we were looking at before, you see a huge variation in the normalization um, as you increase uh, the value of ASM1. ASM2 has almost no effect at the low mass end, but does seem to have an effect in some regions at the high mass end. Okay, and finally, what we can do with this normalizing flows framework is we can invert it and say, given a set of galaxy parameters, what is the actual probability for a, a given set of input conditional parameters? And so we're essentially doing cosmology with a single galaxy here. So reproducing what Paco showed yesterday. So at the moment, you know, the difference between what Paco did is we're only using four properties. So stellar mass, SFR, gas mass, and black hole mass. But when we do this and we run an inference, you know, run this through MC, we get out posteriors that look okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not fantastic. Um, and this is still kind of work in progress to, to be able to do this for multiple galaxies simultaneously. But essentially what we're able to do is kind of surprisingly from a single galaxy, four properties, rule out huge regions of parameter space here at three sigma significance, right? So from a single galaxy, we can say with confidence that omega n is less than 0.3, which I think is kind of neat. Um, so I just want to highlight that I, when I came to this, um, I thought I was the only person doing this. I was very smug. It turns out everybody's doing this. <laughs> so James Kwan is a UCSB graduate student here who's also looking at using these normalizing flow techniques to look at halo occupation distribution. Um, I think he's got finals this week, so he's not around, but you should go and um, chat to him if you're interested. Chang Hun Han, um, who uh, gave a really good blackboard talk on these, on these subjects, has also been doing this and essentially produced these preliminary results for galaxy observables. So using 100 galaxies with photometry from, I think it was illustrious, gets out these posteriors as well. He made me put this very big preliminary sign on this, so uh, take it with a pinch of salt. Um, but it's very, yeah, very exciting application of this. And Kartek's gonna chat tomorrow about star formation histories with these sort of techniques as well. There we go. And finally, I've got one minute. So I just wanna highlight, so the obvious next step with this is to do this with observables like Chang's done. Um, so we're gonna run, well, we're currently running the whole Camel set um, and generating uh, photometry and spectra using synthesizer, which is the new code we're developing. It's all open source for essentially generating synthetic spectra from simulations. If you've got a hydro sim or a semi-analytic model, or if you've just got simple toy models and you want to explore how the observability changes, hopefully use synthesizer, <laughs> um, go and break it. Um, and uh, yeah, any feedback, yeah, really, really welcome. So I'll finish there. The, uh, the archive should hopefully be coming soon when I get back from holiday. Um, <laughs> but yeah, essentially we're able to build this flexible model for the galaxy halo relationship using conditional normalizing flows. And so you can use this to actually explore the, um, the dependence of galaxy properties on astrophysics and cosmology you know, in a really flexible way, ask really interesting questions about the model that you might not be able to do otherwise. You can also use it as a generative model. So generic, generate arbitrary galaxy cellular mass functions for arbitrary parameters. And finally, parameter inference. Uh, so I'll finish there, thank you.
Thank you, Chris. All right, um, do we have any questions? I think, yeah, Joe, you can start. I can take the, yeah, you can take this mic here. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for this great talk. Just a little question more on the model side. What kind of transform did you use? Did you use an autoregressive flow or a coupling transform? It's autoregressive, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, so we so based on like a neural spline flow, I can give you some of the details as well later on, yeah. Yeah, thank you, because those are actually quite easy to um, sample um, up once you build up the sphere, so that's very good. The thank sampling, you. yeah, super, yeah, yeah, super easy with that, yeah. The training was a little trickier, but <laughs> yeah. Peter Beruzzi, um, Chris, thanks for a very nice talk. If you go back to the slide about cosmology with a single galaxy, I think I'm finally starting to understand. Can you please tell me if my understanding is incorrect? When you say that it's cosmology with a single galaxy, you mean that it's a single galaxy randomly drawn from the population? No, so we, I, well, yes, but I mean, what I've done is I've grabbed a galaxy from an LH set simulation, and then I've said, okay, given that galaxy, tell me what the probability is for the different input conditional parameters. Right, and so I'm just trying to understand to, to see, so there is actually a prior in the sense that if you randomly draw a galaxy, it's less likely to be a weird galaxy from that and more likely to be a typical galaxy from that particular set of parameters. And so that information is also sort of partially encoded in the normalizing flow. Yeah, that's interesting, I hadn't thought about Great. that. Um, I guess one of the things I, you know, that I was thinking about was, yeah, what, what galaxies are most informative for, you know, for, for, for getting posteriors on these, on these properties. So yes, you're right, there may be one weird galaxy that you only get with this particular set of, of uh, parameters might actually give you much better constraints than something that's closer to the median galaxy from that simulation. But I'm, just, but I'm it, not sure if it's but completely I think, clear. I think just to clarify that, it's not just that this galaxy would never appear in, say, a lambda, sorry, omega matter of like 0.4 or whatever. It's just that it would be very, very unlikely to appear in that universe and therefore very unlikely to be the galaxy that you picked. Whereas if someone gave you a galaxy that they chose because it was their favorite galaxy, if you didn't know that selection of function, then it would be much harder to make a constraint in this in this space. I think I understand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I can I'm trying to think of the best way to avoid that from the given LH set doing this sort of test, but yeah, so I guess on real data then, yeah, you won't have that prior. Yeah, this is great. I'm almost a bit upset that I haven't heard about this because <laughs> they're not in the universe and we think about this a lot. Um, so I guess this is kind of, you can use this like as an alternative to HOD. Have you somehow benchmarked? Um, I don't know how you would benchmark, but how you benchmark, how you compare it to the HOD? Benchmark in the sense of speed or accuracy? Or? Accuracy more than speed, yeah. No. Um, yeah, maybe we can chat about that because I'm not sure yeah, what the best way to do that yeah, would be, I'm, what the I'm, metric might be. I'm asking, but I don't know what yeah. the benchmark would be. Yeah, yeah at the moment, you know, it's, it, we're basically comparing within camels sort of thing. What I'd like to do is, is, uh, is to do the, you know, the intersim test. So as Paco was kind of emphasizing yesterday, you know, it's, it's key that we have these different simulations. This is a toy model at the moment still just done with Simba, but when we can do this for other, other Galaxy uh, properties and then see if we get the same constraints and, and accurate predictions between Simba and Illustrious, so then I think, yeah, you've yeah. got that robustness that you yeah, can then yeah. start comparing. No, but we should definitely implement this into the LTU pipeline. Thanks. Oh, uh, Pablo from Montreal. Um, Super nice, interesting stuff, trying to wrap my head around a lot of it. Um, so question on this triangle plot, I, let's assume I live in a universe which was not in this original training space. Can I learn something about it? I don't know, machine like learning. You, let's say I got <laughs> NS wrong or the neutrino mass wrong or this, this galaxy formation model didn't span my model. This is machine learning, right? This is not extrapolation. It, you know, they just don't extrapolate well. So no, this would tell you how likely that galaxy is within the manifold of galaxy properties that we've probed here. Okay. Right? If that yes. manifold also overlaps with some sure. you know, different cosmology or different... yeah. I might get lucky, but I shouldn't... I no. shouldn't 
believe it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. I think I'd just say that you know this with a single galaxy was kind of just a, like a let's just see if it works <laughs> kind of thing. I don't think in reality you're going to be going out there doing cosmology with a single galaxy. I don't know maybe Patrick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting that we get similar results to Packer's analysis with a limited set of features, right? So similar sort of constraints on omega m, whereas things like AGN are completely kind of unconstrained, um, which is you know kind of obvious from the plots I showed previously, right? AGN don't seem to have a huge impact on the distributions of properties. Um, so we can already kind of we already kind of know what these parameters should be from what we've seen already, from what we've modeled with the normalizing flow. Um, but just doing this within a kind of formal framework. All right, uh, any other questions? Yeah, we have a little bit of time. So if there are no other questions, I, I do want to ask uh, one thing. So you stated a little bit earlier in your talk that when a, like, when a regression model, when a like, deterministic model doesn't reproduce the, the scatter in, in a given scaling relationship, it is because that is a regression model. But I, I, I'm, I guess like what we saw when we did the, the whole mangrove stuff is that we actually do get the scatters in different distributions right. Um, when you actually include all of the information relevant to like you know that galaxy information history, so so is that actually more a statement about like you know like you're missing some information in your halo, or is that a statement about the, the weakness of using your deterministic regression? Yeah, I mean, so I went and had a look at your paper because I wanted to check, and I you know for stellar mass you get the scatter really nicely. When you go to the appendix, you look at SFR and things, you don't, right? This is still slightly smaller. So I agree that yeah, when you have Within a graph neural network, you have all of this amazing information on the full, you know, uh, formation history that you get a lot closer, right? But there's still going to be some in inherent stochasticity to galaxy formation, right? Yeah. And and you will never be able to, I think, probe that or model that fully just based on these dark matter properties. So yeah, I think yeah, you could add in, you know, down to the particle level, you know, on on this dark matter side, but you'd still underestimate the scatter. In some of these properties, and particularly things that are, you know, more difficult to get from just a assembly history. So, yeah, the, you know, the recent star formation rate, for example, you know, some of the Cartex work showing that the, the variability in this is is, is very key. Um, it's not to say that that's not a valuable way of of, of doing this and, and and learning about this, but I'm just saying that this density distribution or density estimation approach, you know, naturally incorporates all of that. You know, sure. in some sense, you don't care. What causes? You, know? <laughs> yeah, no, no, of course. you just say that okay, I, or you take the things that you you do care about, and you model those conditionally, but then you let everything else just vary, and you and you just let it do what it wants. Sure. All right, thank you. Oh, I think Natalie has a question. Lisa, with if you, oh, I think really yeah, Marco has it. <laughs> Why don't you obtain like um, an uniform distribution when you try to do your like one galaxy? Because if you take like like the, the galaxies like from each one of the catalogs right in, in the LH set we are going to get like I mean the, for sigma h you have like a Gaussian distribution not like an uniform distribution and if you get the same number of galaxies but it, each one of the catalogs I was expecting to see like uniform distributions not like a peak that we are obtaining you mean in the in the inference side of things, or yes. oh, in the density? yes, because you are cheating see, if you are not like taking all the galaxies, because you are not like getting all the galaxies. I mean, how are you taking the galaxies? How are you selecting the galaxies? That's my point. Because if if the elite set is like uh, has a uniform distribution for all the cosmological parameters, I was expecting to see a uniform distribution. Um, well, it's, got, it's more about the, the conditional galaxy. modeled, yeah. So I guess it, here you might see it looks like the AGN parameters um, are non-uniform, but this is just literally modeling the number of galaxies, right? So what you find is as you go to higher AGN parameters, you have less galaxies. So you're not selecting them like randomly? I'm not sure I understand. That's my point, because okay. I was expecting to see this. I don't know. We can chat afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that sounds like a great idea because uh, unfortunately we have to move on, or fortunately. Um, so we have.